Thanks, Aaron. Um, welcome, everybody, to the most important sessions and the most important stream of this Congress. Uh, some of the organizers, and I was sitting back there, we started saying that you sort of fire yourself up before a, a, a series of talks like this, but um, there's actually some truth to that, real truth to that, and that Congresses, conferences like this, you invariably have folks coming forward with new initiatives, in this case for protected areas, that's fantastic, that's wonderful. One reason to get together is so people can make those statements. But it's key then that we follow up and measure the effectiveness of all these things that get announced and started in meetings like this. And so this is what this session is about. Thank you, Aaron, for organizing. It's a real honor to be on this um, stage with all the folks that are leading this group. So it's an amazing group of folks, a real brain trust, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, let's see. And I'm going to talk, my, my charge was to talk to you guys about, uh, about remote sensing. But I'm really going to talk broadly, and, and for most people that means satellite remote sensing. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about satellite, a little bit about airplanes, and then I'm going to just leverage Melody's great talk, Melody, your talk, and just to talk about the in situ side and some new developments there. The real secret here, folks, is to link these different types of sensing together into an integrated network. Jonathan mentioned SMART. Melody talked about this as well. Repetition acts is a good thing here. If we can burn this into our brains, the importance of integrating different types of observations for understanding the effectiveness of protected areas. I can't seem to get the slides. So, oh, next. So three premises in this talk. First, we have to monitor. The question is what? Um, we suggest that for protected areas that we use the status and condition of biodiversity and trends in biodiversity as the monitored subject or topic in terms of health and effectiveness of protected areas. I don't think we'll get a lot of argument about that in this room. There's a great paper by Stephen Columbia et al. in 2009 that was trying to address the question of how you monitor marine ecosystems for their value in producing marine ecosystem services. And that paper basically argued back then that biodiversity, monitoring changes in biodiversity, was a great proxy for getting at other types of ecosystem services that marine protected areas and marine areas generally provide. I'm going to suggest that here, protected areas and the biodiversity in them, how it's doing, is a great proxy for all the things we hope to get out of protected areas generally. Second point I want to make is that we have lots of tools to do this. In fact, most of, this, most of the talks in these two sessions are really a, a sort of a menu, guys, a Chinese menu for the vast array of tools, both direct observation tools as well as models that incorporate those observations or elements of those observations to understand how protected areas are doing. We have a lot in our kit right now, so it's time to get started. But having said that, we do need a plan. And perhaps that's really where we want to come out of this couple of sessions this morning, either in terms of we can start talking about a plan here, we should do so, but more importantly, as we look toward the province of Sydney and, and leaving here with recommendations that Stephen Woodley can take forth through that mechanism to the world beyond on Wednesday, wouldn't it be great if we could call for at least a plan over the next few years of how we can use an integrated system of observations to monitor the effectiveness of protected areas and conserving biodiversity in and around those areas. Okay, on the satellite front, just very quickly, um, this is a, a diagram that we love to show at NASA. It features all of the things going on. This is, these are just NASA satellites. The point here is not to say, you know, look at all NASA's doing, but just to make the point that there are, there's a lot of information coming down from, from space at this time. This captures just a fraction of the satellites that uh, national governments were putting up. The folks from the European Space Agency could put a similar slide up. Folks in Japan could do so, Russia, China, as well as uh, Brazil, Argentina. So take this slide and, and, and maybe take it up in order of magnitude to get a sense of just how many national systems are up there now looking back at our planet from space. In this slide alone, we have systems that are looking at rainfall, looking at land cover, the new Landsat system just launched. Uh, we've got 
systems looking at carbon in the, in, in the atmosphere, systems looking at plan to look at biomass, systems plan to look at soil moisture, sea surface height, temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a vast array of tools that are monitoring changes in Earth systems globally, changes that then drive changes in biological diversity and the effectiveness of our, our, of our protected areas. Airborne systems, likewise, uh, are in a very interesting time. This is some work from Greg Asner and his colleagues at the Carnegie institution. Uh, Greg has put together a, a spectrometer and a LIDAR on an airplane and what you can basically see with that, the different colors in this image rec recognize different essentially biochemistries of the trees and the, the canopies of the trees so you can get down to biochemistry and then they're doing the, the very hard work of going from biochemistry to taxonomy sort of getting to the, the species or gender or perhaps family level identification from those biochemistry seen through the reflectances coming back to the sensor from the tree canopy. With the LIDAR, which is basically a laser that emits pulses from the plane and you read the bounce back, you get a sense of the three-dimensional three structure of the canopy. So in a sense, with this, this combined system of a spectrometer, a hyperspectral sensor, and a LIDAR, you're getting ecosystem composition, function, and structure on one platform. Extremely powerful. The goal, of course, is to do this from space and to do it globally. Airplanes can cover a lot of ground, but not uh, an entire country, continent, or globe. Um, these are just two satellites that are being planned, discussed at NASA. History on the left is a spectrometer, which will get you that, that biochemistry. And then on the right is, a, is an ISAT-2 system that has a LIDAR aborted, and that would get you 3D vegetation structures. The point here being that we're hoping to go from airplanes to satellite in the next, in the next five to ten. And then this is very, very tied to the, the slide Jonathan showed about these small satellites. This is the commercial sector, folks. These aren't government uh, activities, even though it's being launched, in this case, from the space uh, station. This is a commercial group, Planet Labs. Um, you mentioned Skybox, Jonathan, that Google just purchased. What's happening is these companies are launching large numbers of relatively small satellites that get high-resolution looks, essentially imagery, think high-resolution photographs of the Earth's surface. And if you put a lot of them out there, you can get a lot of looks at a lot of different times. And so we're sort of getting to a point in time where we're almost looking at ubiquitous sensing of the Earth's surface with many satellites looking back at the Earth, coordinated satellites, but coordinated being the key word here, providing observations uh, at, you know, sub-daily intervals of what's happening on the surface of the Earth. Just a, a quick thing about scale. The challenge here is obviously the way satellites look at the Earth and see patterns versus the way ecologists, conservation biologists, and protected area managers look at the Earth. This ecosystem sort of scale is where things come together, but of course we also want to know what's happening at the organism scale and at uh, genetic levels as well. So our challenge is to integrate data across spatial and temporal scales to let us understand the full picture. Again, hats off to Jonathan for bringing this up already, and Melody for following up on it. This is uh, just going to be a quick flash through. These have already been discussed uh, by the other speakers of some of the in situ remote sensing devices that are beginning to populate from the ground up and sense to meet the satellite and airborne data coming from, the, from space and the sky down. Uh, drones, we all know a lot of potential here. Here's a poor man's LIDAR and spectrometer being assembled by a point cloud from a drone, getting three-dimensional structure in the canopy by putting a lot of points out there from a, just a commercial off-the-shelf camera and assembling a LIDAR point cloud along with multi-spectral information from a drone. It's been a while we've heard a lot about camera traps, huge potential. But there's also sound as well as light. Of course, you can do sound all day long, including at nighttime. You're not limited when, when, when light is out. So sound is very important for capturing a lot of mammals, insects, other things that may not be moving around all day long. Of course, you can put cameras out with flashes too, I guess. Um, environmental DNA, we've heard about that. Great tool for actually telling what was when over time. It gets you an organism sort of stamp of what's been there, but also tells you a little bit in, in terms of genomics about the history of those organisms, the long time frame of evolutionary history that uh, the genome brings to bear. And then animal tracking, lots of tools available there, and then of course the onset of citizen science is providing us more and more data. 
The challenge is bringing all these things together into a coherent framework, network, whether it be smart or something else. That's really our challenge, and I think what we ought to be calling for today. And we do have Geobon, that has been mentioned by Aaron and others, as a political framework. So part of the problem is, is a technical one, an IT challenge of integrating airborne satellite and in situ data. And that's a, that's a challenge for folks, that, you know, Cisco-like folks that do systems integration. That's a big challenge, not trivial. But we can probably work the technical stuff. The hardest challenge may be the social networking that needs to happen where you've got different communities doing traditionally different things for different purposes, starting to share their observations and integrating both at, at the academic and, and social cultural level. Well, we do have a, a political framework, a political integrator here at Geobon, and, and so the point is let's build upon that and see how we can use it to build the other networks we need to make these couple observation models and systems possible. And I'm just going to also tip my cap to EBVs, Essential Biodiversity Variables. These are some of the examples of what was proposed. If you go to the Geobon website, you can find the full detailed list. But this is an example of some of those that have been proposed already. I think you can still see where we're going here in terms of building up things that are directly sensed to broader classes of EBVs, which can hopefully serve as ultimately leading to indicators for the condition of biodiversity in and around protected areas. And then we, we not only have Geobon, we also have other frameworks out there that are tailor-made for the kind of integration network we need to do. Um, research framework through Future Earth, observations, of course, Geobon. Assessment, which is key, where does this all go? Who cares, why does it matter? We now have the Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, IPCC, if you will, and the IPBES. So we've got an assessment framework that it's calling for all this information that we'll be assembling, and then, of course we have the policy frameworks of CBD, Ramsar, and others. So finally, here's a suggestion as we look forward to putting something together from these important sessions this morning for the Promise of Sydney. I essentially want to say that um, one thing we might want to consider is calling for an integrated global, keyword, plan to network observations and models on status and trends of biodiversity within and around, not just in, but also around protected areas as a means of measuring the effectiveness of those protected areas. Long sentence, a lot to unpack there, but if, maybe if we can work through that, we'll uh, be off to a good start.